All right, amen. Here in Romans chapter 12, I want you to start in verse number 1. Romans 12, 1, the Bible reads, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So he starts out by saying that our body is a sacrifice. We need to lay down our desires. We need to lay down our life. We need to die to our fleshly desires to become holy so we can be used of God. Look at verse 21. That's the first verse. Look at the last verse. Verse number 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. The title of my sermon this morning is How to Overcome Evil with Good. And listen, we are in a spiritual warfare. We need to walk in the Spirit. And this is something that we all have to make choices day by day. The Bible says, Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. God has given us His Holy Spirit. He wants us to, to walk in the Spirit and for our bodies and our lives to be a living sacrifice. Our bodies are still alive, but we should sacrifice our own desire and our own will and follow the will of the Lord. Amen. Follow His will in our life. He says, greater is He that is in you. God's given us the Spirit that can overcome all things in this world. It can even overcome our own flesh. Now the Bible says we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. We are more than conquerors. We can conquer this flesh. We can conquer the problems. We can conquer this world. And we can only do it through the power of Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit. Amen. I want you to look at verse number 9. Romans 12, verse number 9. So how do we overcome evil with good? I believe this whole chapter encapsulates that. We're going to look at the last half of the chapter, verse by verse. Verse number 9, it says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Now, all the verses prior to this are teaching how to have a church as one body. We are all unique members put here together by God so we can help each other and build each other up. And, you know, he says, he says, let love be without dissimulation. He says, don't let your love be fake. Make sure your love is sincere, that it's real. You know, we need to truly love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is the foundation of any Christian church. This is the foundation of biblical Christianity, and yet a lot of churches have totally ignored this. They've gone away from it. They're more worried about their big buildings or what they're known for, their reputation, and our reputation ought to be of brotherly love. Amen. He says it several ways in this chapter. So he says, let our love be without dissimulation. Truly love the brother. Don't have fake love. But then he says, abhor that which is evil. Abhor that which is evil. To abhor means to hate. We need to hate the wicked works of the world and the things even in our own flesh, in our own life, that would prevent us from having love that is without dissimulation. From having true, sincere Christian love. You know, in Romans 16, he says, No, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Right? There are certain people that are going to act not like Christians, and the Bible says, look out for them, be warned of them, and don't be like them. We need to mark them, we need to make note of them, and not be like them. Rather, we should mark those that are walking in love, that are fulfilling what Christ has told us to do, and follow them. Abhor evil, he says. There's a lot of fake Christians. They're making havoc of the church. They're doing evil. You know, we, we should avoid them, ignore them. We should hate them. There's a ton of false prophets in the world that, that the world looks at and says, well, if that's Christianity, I want nothing to do with it. And hey, amen, me neither. You know, you look at the even the ones that are known for love, but it's dissimulation. Like Joel Osteen. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, I can hate Joel Osteen because he is not of Christ. He is a false prophet. I should mark him and warn people about him and, and, and stay away from that type of Christianity because it's fake. The last part of this verse, he says, cleave to that which is good. Cleave to that which is good. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. When you find something that's good and right and edifying, hold on to it. Make sure that you make that your priority as a Christian. The Bible says to try the spirits. We are commanded to test the spirits and try the spirits and make sure that what we're doing is biblical. Look at the next verse, verse number 10. 
It says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Now I want you to turn, keep your finger in Romans 10, uh, 12 here because we're going to be back to it, but go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter number 2. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Now all three of those statements are essentially are talking about brotherly love. We're supposed to be known as Christians. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. We are supposed to be known by our love. Our reputation is to be that of love. And listen, that's not easy. It's not always easy to love your brother and forgive your brother as you ought to. That's fleshly when you don't forgive. It's spiritual when you love as Christ did. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, But as touching brotherly love, you have no need that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. The Spirit that's in you teaches you to love the brethren, to love your wife, to love your children, to have true compassion on people. This is where the Spirit is guiding us. You're in 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse number 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. This is a warning to Christians. There are Christians that are our brothers and sisters that are walking in darkness because they hate each other. They would rather be known for their hatred instead of their love. And the Bible says you're still in darkness. You have not come out into the light yet. There are things you need to get right. And it's your heart. It's your love for each other. This is so important. Listen, this is the basics. This is the milk of the Word. This is the foundation of Christianity. He loved us enough to lay His life down for us and He wants us to be the same way. We ought to follow Christ in His example. But wait, didn't we just read we're supposed to hate evil? You know, I mean, don't you hate your brother when he's doing harm to you? Well, look, you need to. There, there's a time and a place and a proper method of church discipline and dealing with situations. If your brother trespasses against thee, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. So yeah, hey, there is rebuke and there's forgiveness. But listen, as Christians, we need to be known for love. If your brother does something that's harmful to you, consider Christ. If there's someone that just hates you because you're not just like them. Consider Christ. right? It was a contradiction, it says. The sinners that He was saving were putting Him to death. He said, lay it not to their charge. Who, I mean, how, how fleshly was that? Not at all. That's the Spirit of God that needs to work inside of us. And Christ hated sin when He was on the cross. Even he, I mean, He didn't just give in to sin and say, okay, sin's alright. I don't hate sin anymore. right? But He forgave His very offenders the ones that put him to death. Some of those he saved their soul. Flip ahead to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Look at verse number 19. We love him because he first loved us. Right? Now, the, in, in Romans 5, I think it is, it says, We were enemies. Right? We were yet sinners. We were ungodly and he died for us. We were enemies of God and he still loved us enough to lay down His life for us. To reconcile, to forgive us, to pay for our sin. He first loved us. That's why, hey, I'm so, I love Him. I'm so thankful He's died for all of my sins. Even the sins I haven't committed yet. Man, I love Him. I, I'm indebted. I love Him, right? But, but Now, how do we respond? Look at verse 20. 1 John 4.20 If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? This is saying if you're a Christian and you're hating another Christian, a brother you have seen and dealt with, you can't claim I love God. You are not in the love of God. You are not in the Spirit of God when you're in hatred against your brother. We should suffer these things and forgive our brothers and sisters. Give them the benefit of the doubt. We need to love them as Christ has loved us. And this isn't just a recommendation of the Lord. This is His will for our life. This is His commandment. This ought to be our reputation. Look at the next verse. Verse number 21. 
And this commandment have we from Him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Do you understand God has commanded you to love your brother even when he's doing harm to you? Even when he's doing you wrong? You need to love them enough to try to help them get it right. You need to love them enough to be willing to forgive them at the right time and to help them reconcile things and help them to rebalance their own life. That's our job to restore people in the church. Go to Matthew chapter 22. This is a commandment. It's an easy commandment. It's easy by walking in the Spirit. That's where it all starts. Well, you don't know what's happened to me. You don't know how hard it is to forgive those people. Hey, hey, listen. It's easy to walk in the Spirit. It's your choice. You read the Bible. You pray. You ask God for help. And when you cross bridges that you think are hard, you understand that this is easy also. This commandment of love is simple. It's the first step of Christianity. Are you in the Spirit? If you are, you will overcome evil with good. This whole message is about how do I overcome evil with good? I've heard a story in in many churches for years, and I don't remember the pastor they talked about. He must have been famous because I've heard the story in many different churches about a pastor that had a gun pulled on him. He was in a back alley or something, and a guy comes up and puts a gun, you know, and he's ready to kill the guy. And he's like, well, more important than that, you know, if you die today, are you 100% sure you go to heaven, you know? And I mean, would you have that same attitude? Uh Uh-oh, I'm being robbed, but let me make sure you're saved. Well, now that I've got your attention for a minute, let me go ahead and preach the gospel to you. Man, that's that's hard to do, you know, because I mean, your, your flesh wants to fire back right away. Your flesh wants to wrestle that gun away from them, but the spirit ought to be concerned with the destination of their soul. That's Christian love. You're in Matthew chapter 22. Find verse number 37. Verse number 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. How do you know you're right with God? Is love God. Put Him first. Not just categorize Him as I do my thing on Sunday. No. Do you love Him with all your mind? Do you love Him with all your heart? Are you loving Him with your flesh and your heart? Are you doing the hard things? Are you willing to sacrifice to make sure you're right with God? The first and great commandment, verse 39, he says, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh Uh-oh, well now wait, who's my neighbor? Yeah, that's what the Pharisees wanted to know. Right? (laughs) Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Go back to Romans 12. How do I make sure I'm right with God in every aspect of my life? I love God. I I obey Him. And I love my brother. And I demonstrate that love. If I do those two things, I don't have to worry about breaking man's law. I don't have to worry about offending you because I will be right with God. In John 13, again, he's a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. How did He love us? He laid His life down for us. How should we love one another? Lay our lives down for each other. Lay our flesh down and walk in the Spirit for the sake of your brother. He says, by this all men shall know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Are you known for love or are you known for hate? Are you known for walking in the Spirit or are you known for walking in the flesh? This is our choice. This is our reputation as Christians. And listen, I don't care what the rest of the world does. What are you doing? What am I doing? Right? Judgment must begin with you as an individual. You need to judge yourself according to God's Word. And He says, love God, love your brother, do those things, and you will not offend any of God's laws. You will always be right with God. In 1 Peter 1, he says that we should have unfeigned love of the brethren. He says, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Fervent. That's fire. That's excitement. That's zeal. That's not stopping. That's without ceasing. Loving each other with a pure heart fervently. You know, a selfish heart would be, I love you enough to get what I want out of you. You know, I like you enough that maybe I'll get something out of you. You know, that's not pure love. That's not true love. We need to love each other with a pure heart fervently. And that means if you're offending me and you're wrong and I got every right to just yell at you, maybe I should try to love you instead and help you to be restored. 
We need to be on fire, excited for love. He says in 1 Peter 4, he says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Again, fervent charity, fervent love, and that will cover the multitude of sins. What does that mean? That means when you transgress against me, when you sin against me, if I have fervent, on fire love for God's people, I'll overlook that. I'll forget about that offense. I won't care about that. I'm more worried about helping you grow in the Spirit. That's biblical Christianity. How do we overcome evil with good? That's the question today. Look at verse number 11. You're in Romans 12, verse number 11. We need to take things seriously. He says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now keep your finger here and go to Acts chapter 6. Not slothful in business. God's work is business. It's not a game. We need to be wholehearted about being a Christian. Again, fervent, on fire, excited, zealous, not stopping, not thrown away easily, not just walking away, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm upset, I'm, I'm done, I'm done with church. Listen, my whole life, I have seen people that are on fire, they're three to thrive, they're excited for God, they read their Bible, and then they fall out for some reason. Some people are just on autopilot looking for an excuse to stop doing church. And where are they going to end up in a year or two? Well, they're going to slide back into the lifestyle that God doesn't like. They're going to slide back into those old friends, those old habits. They're going to become lazy as people, as individuals. They're no longer fervent. They're no longer taking care of business. They become slothful. God's work is business. You need to take Christianity like it's your very own business. Like you own your own business of being a Christian. You love God. You love your brother. You're in Acts chapter two or 6. Look at verse number 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. He says, we need some help. We've got the the, the disciples are multiplying. There's too many things happening that the preachers now have to stop and serve tables. We need some men to help with the business. But he didn't just say any man will do. No, no, no. We're supposed to be Christians. He, He wants men that can preach and serve tables. Look, he says, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. People that have discernment. Men that are growing in the Word to a point over this business. Yeah, but that's just cleaning tables. That's just taking out the trash. Yeah, but you ought to be growing in your wisdom and discernment in the Bible and God can use you more. It is business. Every aspect of church life is business. Look at verse 4. But we ourselves, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Go back to Romans 12. So it's the ministry of the Word. That is business. God wants you to have your own ministry. God wants you not to just be worried about this church or other churches or other families, but you yourself as an individual have a ministry. Every single Christian does. Mom, dad, children, you need to prepare as a self-employed Christian, if you will. You're working for the Lord. Your rewards come from the Lord. He has people you can minister to that I'll never meet. There are people that you can get saved and preach the Gospel to that your dad or your mom or your brother or sister will never meet. It's your job to be ready to be fervent in spirit and be ready to take care of business. This is God's will for our life. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, "...and that ye study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you." You need to be ready to take care of your own ministry. You need to be ready to pick up your own cross and take care of business. Look, we you know we operate as a family unit, both in church and then your family. And if you're a single man, you're an individual. You say, well, hey, you're still you have a responsibility. You need to take it as a business. He said, not slothful in business. Are you slothful in your Christian life? Are you slothful in in being ready to forgive and ready to? you know, uh, get the sin out of your own life and deal with the problems that the Lord reveals to you? Romans 12.12 So again, the question, how do we overcome evil with good? 
He says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Now, these are some very simple things. This is the milk of the Word, but each of these phrases, I mean, you could do a whole sermon on each one, and, and we won't, but I, we're going to cover each one. This is important. I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Rejoicing in hope. Our hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is who we have confidence in. And, you know, it says that we should abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We should be excited and, and you know, confident that the Lord has our best, you know, uh, uh, future in mind. And listen, we go through tribulation. We go through rough times. He, he says patient in tribulation comes next. Continuing instant in prayer. You know, it says, the Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. How do I have hope for the future? Well, that's Christ in me. I need to encourage myself in the Lord. You know, we should rejoice in tribulation that God will get us through tribulation. This is hard to do. It's easy to say. He says, patient in tribulation. Just be patient. Don't get over overwhelmed. God will get you through it. Right? Being patient in tribulation is rejoicing in the hope that God will get us through the tribulation. He loves us, and sometimes tribulation is to make us stronger Christians. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief suffering wrongfully. Now, the conscience is given to God. And you know, elsewhere it talks about, I think it's Romans 14 where it talks about why am I judged by another man's conscience? Well, you know, if I, I can't eat this meat because someone else's conscience is going to judge me, right? Here he's saying, for conscience toward God, I'm worried what God thinks about me. I'm concerned with my standing for God and I could care less what everybody else thinks about me. The rest of the world can call me names, but if I'm right with God, I have nothing to fear. He says, it's thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. But wait a minute, God, this is suffering wrongfully. I don't understand. I thought if I was right with you, I'd be blessed in every aspect of my life. Well, look, we will be blessed of God, but we're still going to go through tribulation. We need to be patient during this tribulation. Verse 20, he says, For what glory is it if, when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently. What's he mean? Well, when you get pulled over by that state trooper because you're going 95, and you just you don't say anything to the cop, you don't pop off at your mouth, I'm just taking it patiently. He said, what glory is that? You're busted. You're already in trouble, right? He says, but if when ye do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. When you stand for what's right and you get attacked, that's okay with God. God will bless you for that. When you stand for what's right and the world attacks you, hey, welcome to the Christian life. It's not, it's not just Christian life as a bumper sticker. Let's live it out. Let's deal with it. Let's be patient in our tribulation. Let's love our brethren. Let's overcome evil with good. Look at verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow His steps. Now wait a minute. Christ died. That's some serious suffering, right? He went through a lot of things. They mocked Him. They spit on Him. They smacked Him in the face and said, well, if, if you're God, tell us who hit you. Mocking God. And He said, we need to suffer it. He didn't open His mouth. He didn't say anything back to them. He didn't correct them. He didn't call fire down from heaven to destroy them. He took that tribulation patiently. And He did it for an example for us to follow. Because we will suffer. We will go through tribulation in this life. And we have a role model. We have someone to look to. And it's God Himself that was in the flesh. He suffered the same things we suffer. And we can have a role model to look to and say, well, if He got through it, I can get through it too. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. He had that. He's in the flesh. He had that. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Well, why didn't He fire back? He's God. He's perfect. Why do you want to fire back? Hey, because we're in the flesh. We're not always walking in the Spirit like we ought to. Verse 22, look at this. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. 
Now, guile's a bad word, right? How come Jesus didn't cuss at them when they were smacking him and beating him and whooping on him? Well, why didn't he get... Because he says he did no sin. You understand? Sometimes in the flesh, somebody messes with you, you want to just call them a dirty name. Well, that would be sin. He did no sin. He took it. What an example for us. Look at verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. Now, reviled means railing. They said the worst possible things to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had every right and every fact on his side he could have fired back. He could have set them straight. He could have argued with them and won. But he didn't. He kept his peace. It says, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Go back to Romans 12. When he suffered, he threatened not. Boy, you keep messing with me. I'm going to call. I'm going to come over there and beat you. No. Think about it. In the flesh, we always want to try to one up somebody. He suffered. He threatened not. He committed himself to God who judgeth righteously. Jesus said, Lord, you're going to judge this. Lord, it's in your hands. It's God's responsibility to take care of our business. And there are times that we just need to take our hands off the situation and say, God, I'm putting this 100% on you. And however you judge is righteous. Because in the flesh, if I tried to judge this or do this, I would do it wrong. I might hurt somebody or sin or lose my testimony or go against the very basic principle of Christianity, which is brotherly love. So Lord, rather than me sin and break Your commandment of brotherly love, I'm just going to commit this to You. And then I'll have some peace about the situation. I can go on with my life. That last part, he says, continuing instant in prayer. You know, in Romans 1, it says that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. We need to be praying for each other as brotherly love. So how do we overcome evil with good? Look at verse number 13. Distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Right? You don't, hey, be warm, be filled, brother. Oh, you have that need? Oh, wow. So, sorry to hear it. No, you give. Well, what if it hurts? What if you had plans for that month? You, you give. You help them out. You open your doors. You bring them in. You have compassion. That is brotherly love. If you can't even do those things, then I mean, you're just saying that you have brotherly love, but you're not loving in deed also. We are committed to love in word. Hey, I love you. And in deed, here, I got you. Here, take this. Here, let me feed you. Let me, let me Come on into my house. Let me warm you up. That's brotherly love exercised and sometimes that's very hard sometimes that's very hard when you feel justified against somebody and you want to get something right and brotherly love is just take your hands off say god you judge the situation in the meantime help me to maintain my testimony how do we overcome evil with good look at verse number 14 bless them which persecute you bless and curse not Wait a minute, did I read that right? Is that backwards? Aren't we supposed to... No, wait a minute. Bless and curse not. This is the type of Christian we ought to be. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus, it says, was our example. He has given us the Word and the Law and the Spirit so that we can fulfill these things. And He's saying, bless them which persecute you and bless and curse not. When somebody persecutes you, we should not curse them. Man, that's not easy. It's easy to read. It's not easy to apply. But that's the difference in walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh. (laughs) Again, Jesus was our example. He patiently took the persecution and the tribulation. You're in Matthew chapter 5. Go near the end, verse number 44. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You know how hard it is to pray for somebody that hates you and to not just pray it selfishly? Lord, would you make them see things my way? Well, that's a selfish prayer. Lord, would you help me to overcome my weakness? Lord, would you help me to be a Christian and love this enemy? Lord, would you... Protect that enemy. Hey, lay it not to their charge. Boy, that's hard. That's hard to do. That's almost impossible. In fact, it is impossible in the flesh. 
How do we overcome evil with good? We walk in the Spirit. Look at verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Right? How do we know as children of, of the Father? By our love. For He maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Boy, God, my enemy, how come you're still giving him crops? How come you're still paying his bills? Why aren't his children fatherless yet? And that's not right. Look, there's a time and a place for imprecatory prayer, and it's not every day. As Christians, we shouldn't be known for that. It's like, yeah, but if you, boy, if you go to Psalms, I can point to five or ten Psalms where David prayed this. Yeah, how many Psalms are there? How many? 150. And they're mostly about loving God. They're mostly about following His Word. They're mostly about being able to trust in Him and have confidence in Him. And yes, there is that small portion also that says, Lord, You judge them. Lord, You break their teeth out. Lord, You beat them up. You go get them, God. And again, that's still committing it to God. That's not you going and throwing rocks at your enemy. That's you trying to love a brother where you ought to and give people the benefit of the doubt. God still lets the sun shine on them because they need it to live. God still gives rain so their crops will grow so their children can eat. Even your worst enemy, their child, does not deserve to grow up fatherless. Those children deserve to... I mean, they ought to have the same chance to hear the Gospel and grow up in a family that loves them and blessed and have food and clothes. Think of the children when you're hating your enemy. Think how to, how to love your brother. Look at the next verse here. Verse 46. <clears throat> For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? <clears throat> Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven, is perfect. Go back to Romans 12. Perfect means complete. How do we be complete as a Christian? How do we overcome evil with good? We love our enemies. We love our brethren. We say kind things to the sometimes evil world. Sometimes you interact with same... Like you go to a gas station, you always see the same person. Or you go to a certain store and you see similar people. And you can judge in the flesh... You can judge by appearance and say, well, yeah, well, that person there, I bet you, I know what they're into. I know this or that. Hey, why don't you show them some love? And when they need somebody, when they want to look for God, they can come to you and say, boy, that person has always been nice to me. That person has always been kind to me. That person wasn't just quick to judge me because of my circumstance. That's Christian love that we ought to have. Amen. Remember he said, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things today. He says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Paul's saying, look, we took the abuse. We were defamed. They're talking bad about us. You know they called Paul a reprobate? They accused him of being a reprobate. And he said, I was defamed. And I'm not saying this to shame you. I'm saying it to warn you. Right? Somebody always, I always heard the saying, make your words sweet in case you have to eat them. Right? <laughs> if those words come firing back at you, you better hope you were, you know, speaking some love. Speaking some love in truth. There's a warning. Without love, you are overcome of evil. Evil has conquered you and you lose when you don't have any love. When you've lost your love, you've lost the battle. Christ wants us to win. You're in Romans chapter 12. Look at verse number 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Keep your finger there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So he says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Brotherly love is to have sympathy and empathy and compassion and to comfort people and try to understand what they're going through. And try to, I mean, when your friend is, their heart is broken and they're in tears, it's okay to cry with your friend. You, know, you need to just stop this crying. I don't want to be around that kind of attitude. It's going to mess up my day. Hey, their life is in danger. Their whole life is messed up and they're in tears. Sit down and cry with them, weep with them. That's true love. When they're rejoicing, even if you're having a bad day, you need to rejoice with them also. 
They're excited they're about their child. They're excited about their job. And you're just, well, it's just been a rough week. Well, you know what? Let them lift you up and rejoice with them. First Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse number 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also ye do. Look, this is what the church is all about. This is why we don't forsake the fellowship, the assembling, because we need to comfort each other. We need to edify one another. We are all given different gifts and God put us together to help each other. Comfort yourselves together and edify one another. Look at verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace amongst yourselves. How do we keep peace in the church? Y'all need, y'all need to be loving me as the leader. okay? Y'all need to love those that are your leaders. You need to love the guy that's leading the soul winning time and not argue with him and not question why he paired you up with somebody or why we're going to this neighborhood. You need to love the people that are trying to help lead you. Children, you need to love your parents. They're trying to lead you. It says, esteem very highly in love for their work's sake. Sometimes all they're, they're consumed with the vision of the work of accomplishing this ministry. They're taking it serious as business and you're just walking around lackadaisical and then boom, Something gets asked of you and it's like, well, I don't know if I want to... I, I, that guy just upsets me. He just ruffles my feathers. Why don't you show some brotherly love? Why don't you show yeah, so a little bit of respect? They're admonishing you. They're trying to encourage you. They're laboring among you because they love you. And if you follow a leader like that, if you become that kind of follower, you will become that kind of a leader in your own house, in your own ministry. But look at verse 14. He shifts gears here. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Look, we just talked about another warning. Warning those that are overcome of evil. He says, in the church, warn those that are unruly. Well, Now, what's the rule? What's the commandment? Love your brother. So when somebody goes against that rule, we need to warn them. Hey, man, you're not walking in love. Hey, you're not walking in the Spirit of God. You're being fleshly and selfish. Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. How do we encourage each other? Even the feeble-minded. We help the weak. We support the weak. We be patient with people. There's a kid in a church, TJ, we used to go to, and he would he'd always come up and, and he was a, a special needs kid. This kid, I mean, naturally, he just had a loving attitude. And he always had the most interesting things that he said. He would always make the wildest statements or connect. You know, uh, and all I could do was smile when I talked to him because it was always an adventure. You never knew what he was going to say. But true patient was just being loving and listening to that guy. Listening to this little guy just talk. He just, he just wants to be loved. Every baby just wants to be loved. Every Christian just wants to be loved. And we need to do that. We need to love each other. It took patience sometimes to listen to what TJ had to say. But he needed to know that that's Christian love. He needed to see in the church that's how we treat each other. We support those that are weaker than us. I could have said, hey kid, I don't have time. Hey kid, I'm busy. I don't know what you're talking about. I could have been rude to him. He said I was patient and loving. And whenever he would walk up to me, it brought a smile to my face because my attitude was right that I need to show this kid some love because I don't know what's going on in his world. But the kid needed some love. That's the type of Christian we ought to be. That's how we overcome evil with good. Look at verse 15. See that you render... See, I'm sorry. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Right? It's not about getting revenge. God, I'm going to get you get evil. I'm going to do evil back. No, no. Oh, you... You knocked out my window. I'm going to cut your tires. Look, forget about all that. Don't be in the flesh. But he says, both among yourselves and to all men. Both in the church and out of the church. You don't always have to return evil to people when they do something wrong to you. Look, he says, rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. How do we overcome evil? With good prayer. Praying for one another. 
Praying for those that despitefully use you. Verse 18. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Yeah, but you don't know the disaster I'm going through. Hey, give thanks. God's will is being worked out. God has something better for you. God has some growth ahead for you, but first He has to purge that branch. He's got to clean up the tree and knock off some dead limbs so we can grow mightily in the Lord. In everything, give thanks. Now, if you're not being patient with men, if you're not giving thanks, if you're not being loving, if you're not you know, uh, warning the unruly, then what happens? Look at the next verse. Quench not the Spirit. What is it when you quench the Spirit? It's when you're not being loving. It's when you're not thankful for what you have. It's when you're not in Christ. How do you quench the Spirit? By ignoring the Word of God. By ignoring the drawing of the Holy Spirit to tell you to forgive people and to be loving when you ought to because that's real Christianity. Oh yeah, but I, I want to be the manliest Christianity I can. Well, that's fleshly. Why don't you humble yourself? What if people say you're not as manly as them? I don't care. As long as I'm right with God. For conscience sake toward God, I want to be right with God and that means I need to be loving. I need to work on my love life with each with Christians. We need to love each other. We need to tell the brethren, hey man, I love you. A lot of you guys know when I talk to you on the phone, I tell you, I love you. And it's not weird and it's okay and that's right in God that's godly. For a man to tell another man, in Christ, I love you. You're my brother. I got your back. I want to help you. I pray for you. That's the way it ought to be. How do we overcome evil with good? Look what he says in verse 20. Despise not prophesying. Don't hate the preaching, especially when it gets you. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Go back to Romans 12. We're almost done here. Abstain from all appearance of evil. We need to make sure we don't look like the world. We need to make sure that we have the love of Christ. How do we overcome evil with good? Look at verse number 16, Romans 12, 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Yeah, but I know more than them. Right, but how's he start out? Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. Think about this phrase first. Mind not high things. I'm so worried what the rest of the world says. I'm so worried about what that big... Forget that. Forget the high things. Right? I always heard growing up, don't sweat the small stuff. Yep. And nothing's big. Right? Everything's small stuff. When you, really, when you look at how Christ is on the throne, He's given us victory. We have overcome this world through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. What really is the big stuff? Don't even mind those high things. Don't worry about those the big things. God has got you, and He's He's helping you grow through His will. Eternal mindset. Amen. Eternal mindset. That's good. We need to humble ourselves and help each other. You know, in Timothy he says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Too many times we're worried about becoming rich. Oh man, I want to get this stuff. I need all those things. I, I can get every... God, I'll work for you as soon as I get a, a, very, a profitable business and a big house and all the cars I need, everything. No, he says, don't worry about those things. Yeah. Start with the basics. Start with the simple. Serve God in the little things and He'll work out the details on the rest. Amen. Look at verse number 17. Recompense no man evil for evil... Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Again, he's saying don't get even. Don't worry about getting even. How do we provide things honest in the sight of all men? When other people on the outside are looking in that are not brethren, and they see two brothers in the right heart, in the right spirit of God, they can say, well, I mean, those, those two are acting like a Christian. Like I think they ought to. You know, God wants us to be loving, and we need to learn to let things go. That's honest in the sight of all men. In 1 Peter 2, again, he said, For even here unto you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leading us an example that ye should follow His steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth, who when He was reviled, reviled not again. Again, how do we act like Christ? We don't worry about returning evil to those that do evil to us. 
That's hard to do, but he says it all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, that we need to be loving. We need to love those that persecute us, love those that hate us, love those that lie about us, and God will judge. He will take care of business. Look at verse number 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Yeah, but my neighbor's not a Christian. In fact, I, I think they might be a rep. Hey, you know what? Live peaceably. There's no sense in picking fights everywhere you go. There's no joy in having a war every time you turn a corner. There is a time for peace. There is a time for love. And we ought to live peaceably with all men. That's God's will for our life. And then we will have a peaceful life. Verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. There is a place for wrath, and we give those things to God. Well, it says be angry, yeah, and sin not. And if you're sin, if you be angry and you become wrathful and you return fire, you return evil, and you're avenging yourself, then you're in sin. You've already broken God's law. Deuteronomy 32, he says, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. God says, don't worry, I'll get them in my time. And we don't need to judge God unrighteously and say, but God, I want you to get them this week. I, oh, why don't you get them today? Come on now. Look, you don't know how He's going to judge, and you don't know when He's going to judge, but you commit that to Him, and then just live peaceably with those around you. You just let it be. Hebrews 10, he says, For we know Him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto Me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge His people. His people. In, a, in, in context. Lord, that brother, he's done me wrong. Boy, he's talking about me. He's doing all these things. I want to go get him. But that's the flesh. In my spirit, Lord, I'm committing this unto You. Lord, You be my avenger. You be my judge. I'm not even going to say, Lord, here's how I want You to get Him. I want You to get Him like this first, and then get His house, and then get His... No, 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 no. Lord, I've committed it to You in Your time, in Your way. You will judge Your people, and I will be judged for my response in the situation. I will be judged for my love or for my lack of love. And the only way to overcome evil is with good, and that's with love. Look at verse number 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Right? If his donkey is in the ditch, pull him out of the ditch. Oh, look, he's got a flat tire on the side of the road. <laughs> no, why don't you stop and get your jack out? Amen. Why don't you show him some love? Why don't you be forgiving? And let God judge them. And God deal with the situation. Look at the last verse here. Be not overcome of evil. This is the goal in the Christian life is to not become an evil Christian. A hurtful Christian. You're, you're right in the Spirit and wrong in the flesh and, and your life is worthless because you're not accomplishing things. That's an evil Christian. He says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Stop being selfish. Start being loving. Love your brethren. Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. Let God judge them. Look at the next chapter. Look at Romans 13. I want you to look at this in verse number 8. Romans 13, verse number 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. What do I owe you? To love you. Well, why do I owe that? Because Christ loved me first. He died for me and He said, now I need to go and do the same thing. I owe you love. That's God's commandment. And if I do that, I will fulfill all of God's laws. I will not break any of His laws. Verse 9, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Any other commandment in the Bible can be summarized under this one category, are you loving your neighbor? Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. If, if I see that your car door is left open 
and I truly have love for you and I go to close the door and there's a hundred dollar bill sitting there, I'm in the spirit. I'm not oh, I'm gonna make sure that gets back to you. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna put it on, I'm not gonna take it. You think you wouldn't steal from a brother if you love him. You would help him. And that's being in the spirit. Verse eleven. Romans thirteen, eleven. And that knowing the time that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. It's time to wake up and be a biblical Christian and understand we need to love each other. And that is the foundation of Christianity. That is the greatest law. That's how to fulfill all the laws is to be filled with the love of Christ. He says, if you fulfill the royal law, According to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. That's James. Ye do well if you just fulfill the royal law. You want to be like royalty? You want to rule like kings and priests? Love your neighbor. Love your brother. Overcome evil with good by the love of Christ. John 13.35, Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are My disciples if you have love one to another. Let's be known as disciples of Christ for our willingness to love the unlovable. Because in God's eyes, we're all unlovable. I don't deserve it. I'm thankful for it. Let's return the favor. Let's start loving some people that need it. Let's build this church on that concept. Let's pray. Amen. Lord God, thank You for Your love. Lord God, thank You for Your righteousness and Your holiness. Lord, we want to become holy and we do that by following You. Lord, thank You for giving us an example. Lord, I pray that You would help us to commit this to our heart and understand that we are commanded to overcome evil with good. Lord, help us to be more loving. Help us to live up to the name Christian and we know that You'll bless us for it. Lord, I pray You bless the soul winning this afternoon and I just pray You would continue to bless this church. Thank You, Jesus. Amen. Amen.